yesterday, December 7, 1941, a date which will live in infamy. The United States of America was suddenly and deliberately attacked by naval and air forces of the Empire of Japan. No matter how long it may take us to overcome this premeditated invasion, the American people in their righteous might will win through to absolute victory. The day of December 7, 1941 and the attack on Pearl Harbor would not only shape the future of America, but would drastically affect the entire world. These events would prevent the almost certain future of the Thousand Year Reich and the greater East Asian Code prosperity sphere. But what if I told you on that fateful morning in Hawaii, from decoded messages in the days and months leading up to the strike, to a plethora of warnings the morning of, the entire Japanese attack could have been prevented before it truly began. But similar to the events of 9-11 that took place nearly five decades after this, a lack of preparation and an omnipotent mindset, America would fail to stop the Japanese assault, leading them to join the bloodiest war in the history of the world. This is how America could have, but failed, to prevent Pearl Harbor. The warning signs of an aggressive conquering Japan were apparent throughout the world as early as 1894, where they cautiously took control of islands in the Pacific and began waging war with the aging Chinese Empire, in which it would all come to a head when they took control of Manchuria in 1931. Similar to Hitler's Nazi regime to the West, Japan had a strong ideological belief in their racial superiority over Asia. This belief was a form of pan-animism, in which their goal was to expand their empire to unite Asian territories and pull them away from Western imperialism, having Japan as the leader in the East. This anti-Western ideology led to many confrontations in Japan between Westerners and the Japanese citizens. These confrontations even happened to American military and diplomatic members, one of the most notable happening to Edwin Layton, a naval attaché at the time, when he was assaulted in a bar one night by a xenophobic Japanese man. But while Japan fought and tried to separate their ideological views from the West, they couldn't separate themselves from the West economically. Because of their quick expansion across Southeast Asia, Japan had a desperate need for natural resources and raw materials to feed their expansionism and war machine. And much of those resources did come from America. America, seeing the anti-Western military campaigns occurring by the Japanese to the East, took some cautious steps to slow down Japan's expansion. By passing the Export Control Act of 1940, they limited the amount of strategic minerals, chemicals, aircraft engines, parts, and equipment that were allowed to be sent to Japan. And while this certainly hindered Japan's war machine, it didn't stop it, as their most needed resource was crude oil and it was still flowing freely into the country. But things would continue to spiral when in 1941 Japan joined the Tripartite Act and began moving troops into French Indochina and the Netherlands East Indies. This was too much for President Roosevelt to overlook, and not taking Edwin Layton's warning that this would pull America into war, Roosevelt would put an embargo on crude oil heading to Japan. With this in the Japanese eyes, this was a direct attack on them and their destiny of taking control of Asia. Whether Roosevelt knew it at the time or not, this was the first strike of the match of war that would spread across the Pacific. In the early 1930s, American codebreakers were able to figure out the Japanese Purple Code, which was their code system they used for diplomatic messages. With this, America, in theory, had a way of figuring out major Japanese plans and movements. But in reality, the system used to decipher the intercepted messages, which were nicknamed magic, and then relay them to the necessary people were absolutely abysmal. To begin with, both the Navy and Army used the information provided by magic. And because of this, they alternated daily with who deciphered the messages received. The system many times caused confusion between the two branches and prevented them from discovering patterns in the messages. 
To make matters even worse, only a select few people in the American government had access to the entire collection of decoded messages, as they were afraid that it could fall into the wrong hands, notifying Japan that they had been able to break one of their important codes. And even and even with all of this, the Japanese Purple Code was not the most vital code needed to be broken by the Americans. The code that America failed to crack was the Japanese Naval Code, nicknamed JN-25. This code contained the desperately needed military information and naval movements of the Japanese. So to basically sum up America's code-breaking skills, they could read mostly useless diplomatic messages from Japan but couldn't piece together the few valuable pieces of information found in them, and couldn't even attempt to read the valuable military information. The best America could do out of this is realize that Japan was preparing something. They didn't know what or where, all they knew was that something was coming. Some can claim that it was easy to miss or misread the warnings leading up to Pearl Harbor and what the Japanese were planning, but there is no excuse for America's failure in missing the red flakes that occurred during the morning of December 7th, 1941. One of the most notable red flags was when destroyer USS Ward fired upon and destroyed a Japanese midget sub as it tried to sneak into Pearl Harbor around 6.35 a.m almost a whole hour before the Japanese planes attacked. This was one of five midget subs that the Japanese would attempt to use during their attack, with the sub's suicide orders to fire upon Battleship Row during the air raid. The USS Ward would attempt to message their command about their fight with the sub, but their message would be delayed until it was too late, in large part due to the fact that it was a warm Sunday morning and most of the officers were relaxing away from the command posts. This unawareness would rear its head again around 7.10 a.m. when a single brand new radio operator would spot a large number of planes approaching the island. Consulting with the single officer at the command post, the officer would tell the radio operator, quote, well don't worry about it, end quote. Everyone believed that it was a squadron of B-17s coming from California, but they were horribly wrong, and it led to the most crushing defeat in American history up to that point. At 7.55 a.m., Japanese planes would destroy much of America's Pacific Fleet, killing over 2,400 people. On December 8, 1941, the following day, America would declare war on the Empire of Japan and join the bloodiest war the world had ever seen. The events that transpired on that fateful day in the early December of 1941 would forever affect America and the world as a whole. But the sad reality is, it could have easily been prevented only if American leadership took action and prepared when the early signs of war arose, or at the very least, moved when the flashing signs occurred mere hours before the Japanese attack, instead of seeing behind their arrogance and cockiness.